but for the moment, I'd like to hand over the rostrum to the president of our board of trustees, Hal Rosenberg. Thank you, Mike. And welcome, everyone. Uh, I now call this meeting to order and uh, appoint as chair Mr. John Meggs, the secretary of the board of trustees. Mr. Meggs. Thank you, Hal, and a uh, very good evening to everybody. There appears to be a, a quorum present. Indeed, there is a, a quorum present, which is one uh, quarter of the membership, either in person or by proxy. We have uh, people who have been uh, nominated to be um, directors for uh, three-year terms. They are uh, 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 Nicholas Constan, um, uh, Maud Deshaunce, John Meggs, Steve Mullen, Richard uh, Snowden, uh, uh, Clarence Wolf, Charles Keats, um, Mariah Thompson, and uh, Joseph Evans. There are no additional names that have been um, uh, placed into nomination by the membership, and the nominations are therefore closed. According to our bylaws, the following slate of officers have been elected for the next two years, <coughs> including, I'd like each of you to stand, um, uh, as uh, President Hal Rosenberg, he's already stood, but it certainly won't hurt him to stand again <laughs> by the Dr. Kellett. <laughs> Vice um, uh, President Maud Chance. Maud's over there. Um, um, Secretary John Meggs, that's me. According to our bylaws, trustees may only serve. Uh, three consecutive terms, each of them being uh, three years. Charlie Landreth is uh, currently serving the final year of his third term as a trustee of the library company with his term expiring next May. Charlie, would you uh, stand and be recognized? He's been, been elected to... Uh, <laughs> like to have a show of hands of shareholders present who did not return their uh, uh, proxy cards. Okay, those of you who did not return the proxy cards. Those in favor of the slate, raise your hand. I think everybody's able to vote on that one. That one, if they choose. Thank you. Those opposed to the slate, raise your hand. Seeing none, there were none. Sounds like our our um, uh, uh, slate has been voted in. So now I will bring back uh, uh, Hal Rosenberg for his report. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. Uh, this last year has been uh, has been wonderful. It is been one that has been marked with just great energy, great enthusiasm, and great accomplishment. I'm just going to go over a few highlights of our, of our past events and uh, our past accomplishments just to give you an idea, although most of you know what has been going on in the library company uh, for, the, for the last year, and it certainly is something that warms my heart. Uh, our annual dinner. We had uh, Professor Alan Taylor, who was the Thomas Jefferson Memorial Foundation Professor of American History from the University of Virginia, Pulitzer Prize winning author of the great book William Cooperstown, won a second Pulitzer Prize for a book on the War of 1812. He's written books on the American Revolution. He was 
He was our, our speaker, a true superstar at our annual dinner. At our lecture in honor of John Van Horn, we had Ronald White, who was the author of his most recent book is in the American Ulysses, which is a biography of Ulysses Grant. But he was known also for writing what the critics have acclaimed as the best single volume treatment of uh, Abraham Lincoln. Written several books on Lincoln as well, and uh, he gave us a, a terrific, terrific lecture. The great thing about this is that we attract the superstars, and that for, to, so to be a shareholder and to be involved in the library company gives you the opportunity to see scholars and authors that you're not going to get a chance to see very many other places. So th th that was, those, those two events were fabulous. Uh, our exhibitions created by our conservation team uh, as you know, I'm sure, The Living Book, New Perspectives on Form and Function. And that traced the evolution of the book through time, and it emphasized the book as an object to be studied and explored uh, in, in addition to the fact, in addition to its content, or exclusive of its content. Argento. Argento this year celebrated the success of our $140,000 campaign to acquire a large collection of William Russell Birch materials, which you are going to get a chance again to see tonight. Uh, at the Junto, we had the great honor of having Emily Cooperman, the person who wrote the book on William Birch, the one who is the true expert on William Birch, speak to us about his works. One of our innovations this year, uh, and that was brought to us by our director, was uh, to create a seminar uh, that would be a learning experience where we had the opportunity to learn from primary source materials, and in this case, the uh, subject of the seminar was Benjamin Franklin. We had five sessions, and uh, they were presented to us. We did it in conjunction with the American Philosophical Society, and they were presented to us by Jim Green, by Jim's wife, by uh, uh, Patrick Spiro, who is from the American Philosophical Society. We had the chance to look at various aspects of Franklin's career, and uh, we were forced for homework to read the autobiography, which uh, you have to do your homework if you're paying for a seminar. Seminar was a great success, and I think we have the last one on May 3rd. Uh, we are hopeful that this model, and we're starting the Birch Seminar, I think next week as well, or in two weeks. Uh, we are hopeful that this will be a model for us to reach out to the community and to provide a great learning experience based on the expertise that we have available to us under our roof, and as well as all the unbelievable materials that we have available to us. Uh, in addition, Mike also innovated the Franklin Circles, in partnership with the 92nd Street Y in New York City. And that program was dedicated to Franklin's 13 virtues uh, and, the at the, and their applicability to today's society. And basically, what the, uh, the model there was to take a, one of Franklin's 13 virtues, discuss it, and, uh, and, get, and have really basically create intellectual engagement. I think that that was a success. Mike, was that a success? Still is. Still a success going. because 13 virtues are hard to cover. One a month. It's yes. Take us. Uh, innovations. We've completed a multi-year technology upgrade. We've and have also redesigned our website to provide fresh images and make it easier to search and uh, just make it just more user-friendly all in all. We're also engaged in a very long, extended strategic planning process because with Mike's leadership, uh, we have to look to the future. And uh, it, to that end, we have partnered with a national consulting firm, TDC, uh, to basically map out 
what the library company is going to look like in the next five years, and when Mike addresses you, he's going to tell you more about that. We'll talk a few seconds about our finan financial contributions, and we've had many. Uh, I just want to talk about a few of the standout gifts that we had. Uh, as you know, we had a five-year NEH challenge grant that uh, was designed to endow our program in African American history. Uh, that was a $2 million <coughs> endeavor, and uh, we completed it. And we actually completed it before we had to complete it. And one of the reasons, of course, was because of the great generosity of Peter Benalio and Willow Carey, who donated more than $100,000 to enable to meet us, enable us to meet our challenge on time which is just an, an excellent accomplishment. It's great to be here. Apparently, if you don't make it, you've got to give the money back, and we don't like to give money back. <laughs> <laughs> uh, shareholders David Morris and Eleanor Morris Cox of the Marriott C. Morris family donated $50,000 to create a fellowship in honor of their ancestor, Samuel Rhodes, a supporter of William Still's work on the Underground Railroad. Uh, our own trustee, Professor Randall Miller, issued a final challenge gift in 2017 in connection with the NEH challenge, asking people to match his $20,000 contribution in support of a named fellowship in honor of Dr. Richard Newman, who, as you will remember, was our immediate past director and who is an outstanding scholar in African American history. Uh, and so thanks to Professor Miller. A special thanks to uh, Trustee Emerita Helen Weary for her substantial support of the annual appeal and her support of our Birch acquisition. And what would uh, recognition of donors be if we didn't single out the anonymous ones? <laughs> <laughs> we had one anonymous donor give us $30,000 in 2017 for the NEH endowment <coughs> and one anonymous donor gave us $50,000 to support the strategic planning effort that we have underway. And of course we, we thank them very much. Of course it also reminds me, I don't know if anybody is familiar with Larry David, the Larry David show. <laughs> if you are, you may remember that uh, when the, when Ted Danson was the anonymous donor, everybody said, uh, we know who the anonymous donor is. <laughs> but in this particular instance, we don't. Uh, foundations. <laughs> we are pleased to announce that, uh, that additional foundation support for the William Birch, William Russell Birch Exhibition and Symposium uh, was provided to us uh, in the amount of $20,000 by the following three foundations. The Terra Foundation, the Center for American Art of the Philadelphia Museum of Art, and the Wyeth Foundation for American Art. I'm going to take a, a minute uh, to remember some of our members who have passed on. Elizabeth Lee Oliver was a longtime shareholder. She had been a shareholder since 1973, and she passed away in August 2017. Mrs. Oliver was the great, great, great granddaughter of Matthew Carey, the early American publisher and political economist, who in 1785 founded what became the Lee and Fevager uh, publishing firm of Philadelphia. Her great, great grandfather was Isaac Lee, the prominent publisher and natural historian who specialized in mollusks and whose significant collection of freshwater mussels is now housed at the National Museum in Washington, D.C. Ms. Oliver gave her share to her great niece, who is now a new shareholder at the library company. In 2017, we also lost Samuel Freeman II, who had been a shareholder since 1999. He was the chairman of the board of directors of Freeman Auctions. After seven generations of operation and international experience, Freeman's is America's oldest auction house. While we will miss Mr. Freeman, his wife Peggy Freeman will carry on his legacy by holding his share, which belongs to the founder of Freeman's, belongs to the founder of Freeman's. His original share uh, 
is in the name of Tristan Banfield. And uh, of course, we acknowledge that Freeman's is one of our strong corporate partners. So we, we send them our condolences and we wish them well. In July 2017, Robert J. Gill, a shareholder since 1996, also died. He was the oldest member of record of Christ Church when he died. In addition to the library company, Dr. Gill was a member of the Union League, the Civil War Roundtable, and also of American Legion Post 405. He was known for his humanitarian work as a renowned physician and also for his distinguished service in World War II and the United States Army Medical Corps. Bruce Cooper Gill, his son, and the executive director of the Harrington House will continue his legacy as a library company shareholder in his honor. And now, you've heard the names of the new and remaining trustees. Uh, I'm going to tell you a little bit about each of them, even though you've already voted in them, so you can't take it, your vote back in case you have something you don't like or realize that one of them owes you money. <laughs> Nicholas Constant. He has been an, the adjunct professor at the Wharton School of the University of Pennsylvania since 1995. He is on the board of the Lantern Theater and a trustee of various funds in the fund complex of Optimum Fund Trust. Our vice president, Maude Deschanze, was the Fowler Van Setvoort, keeper of the Near Eastern collections at the University of Pennsylvania Museum of Archaeology and Anthropology. She participated in excavations in Iran and Syria and is an experienced editor and author. Maud has served on the boards of the Zoological Society of Philadelphia, the Friends of the Philadelphia Museum of Art, and the Print Club, and she is not just a valued colleague, but somebody that I rely on. I'm just happy to have her again agree to be Vice President. John Mays. Another stalwart. John Meigs is a senior partner at Saul, Ewing, Arnstein, and Lair, LLP, where his practice is focused on private client, estates and trusts, and family business matters. He has been on the board of various organizations, including Independent Seaport Museum and Woodmere Art Museum, and is currently on the board of the flagship Olympia Foundation. Thank you, Mr. Meigs, for your service. Steve Mullen is a president of eConsult e Solutions, Inc., a Philadelphia economic consulting firm. Mr. Mullen, who is Philadelphia's Director of Commerce and Director of Finance, is active in civic and cultural activities, serving on several nonprofit and for-profit boards. Richard Wood Snowden is the managing partner of Bowman Properties, which owns and manages a portfolio of historic residential and, and commercial buildings in Chestnut Hill. He has served on the boards of numerous civic and historic organizations and sites, and uh, he has been extremely helpful in uh, helping us manage and acquire our Irving Street properties, which are going to be a significant part of the library company's future, which you will hear about in the, in the near term. Clarence Wolf. Clarence Wolf. You can say Clarence Wolf has the blood of the library company flowing through his very veins. <laughs> Edwin Wolf II, who was the legendary librarian of the library company and, um, and a student of Dr. Rosenbach, uh, was, uh, his Clarence's, was Clarence's cousin, was his father's cousin, father's first cousin once removed. Very hard to tell what exactly that means, but I know that I <laughs> share it. For over 40 years, Clarence has owned and operated the George S. McManus Company. He's a seller of rare books and manuscripts, specializing in Americana, and he is one of the top Americanas in this country, as well as English and American literary first editions. He has played a major role in building some of the most important collections of Americana in this country, and in particular, collections dealing with Benjamin Franklin. Charles P. Keats. Charles is a partner, general counsel, and chief compliance officer at Veritable LP, a high-end financial services company founded in 1986. 
He serves on the board of and actively supports several Philadelphia arts and cultural institutions, including the Pennsylvania Ballet and Landmarks, and he is a, he is a birch collector himself, and he has uh, he's taken the reins in uh, motivating us to do the exhibitions that, that we're doing in connection with birch and the seminars as well. So, and uh, Charles, is he here? I don't know if he's here yet. Okay. And now, you've heard the name, you voted in two new trustees that we are absolutely delighted to, to have with us. Uh, Joseph Evans, who we've known for a very long time and has been a, uh, has been a stalwart at the library company, has helped us in investments and served on committees. He is uh, an excellent man. We finally convinced him to join the board uh, because he says he's retired. I don't know about that. <laughs> According to his biography, he is a retired investment advisor to endowments and foundations. In recent years, he has been a private equity investor and board member of invested companies. He was also a founder and general partner of a family investment partnership and has served on a number of nonprofit boards of directors, including hospitals and private elementary and secondary schools. He has been finance committee member of a library company for the past four years. And we welcome Joe. Mariah Thompson, I'm very, very pleased to be able to get her as well. Mariah is an architectural historian with extensive experience using our collections. Some of her publications include Robert Smith, architect, Builder, Patriot, 1722 to 1777, The Athenaeum of Philadelphia, Celebrating 200 Years and Images of America, Wawa. She has served on the board of directors and as secretary of the Athenaeum of Philadelphia. Ms. Thompson served on the board of the Hospital of the University of Pennsylvania and on the vestry of the Church of the Redeemer in Bryn Mawr, where she is now on the project management committee overseeing construction of the new parish house. We welcome you, Mariah. Very happy to have you. I'm going to talk to you a little bit. The one thing that we have learned going through this strategic planning exercise is that of the five pillars, and you don't know what these pillars are, I might be talking to you about them, but the number one pillar, the thing that identifies us the most, the thing that, that charges the jets of our shareholders uh, and our public is uh, our, our collections. And so, and for very, very good reason. But I want to talk to you about some of our most, most uh, important acquisitions over the last year. In November, our library, James Green, traveled to Cambridge to visit our trustee emeritus, Dr. Charles Rosenberg. Dr. Rosenberg donated more than 500 books from the section of his library on disease. Cholera, which was the subject of his first book, tuberculosis and other diseases, plague and smallpox, along with smaller subcollections on mental hygiene, nervous disorders, and anesthesia. We had to clear out a lot of, we had to clear out room to accommodate this incredibly important collection. With the retirement of Dr. Rosenberg's wife, and that's Dr. Drew Faust, who was the his former president of Harvard, it is, uh, we are hopeful because now they had to move out of the big Harvard house and the, the book space is even less and less. We are hopeful that uh, we will be acquiring more of Dr. Rosenberg's collections and I know that we will because he's, he's promised to us. These kinds of collections, um, these donations, ensure that our collections grow and expand and they become, of course, more accessible and useful to scholars. In women's history, which of course is one of our strengths, we feel particularly fortunate to have acquired photographic portraits of American women of renown. Thanks to the Junto funds that we raised in 2016, in 2017 we purchased the cabinet photograph of astronomer Maria Mitchell, 1818-1889, and carte de visite photographs of writer Jesse Benton Fremont, 1824-1902 and taxidermist Martha Maxwell, 1831 to 1881. But the, the one that is the most outstanding of the group is the carte de visite depicting Sojourner Truth, 1799 to 1883. 
and the, the photo has the following caption. I sell the shadow to support the substance. As historian Neil Painter has shown, Sojourner Truth indeed used the sale of the, of the CDV of Card de Visite to support herself, much as she sold the text of her life story. It, the picture depicts Truth seated with her knitting in her lap. And finally, and, and we, you know, this, this is just so that we can, just so I can sit down and, and stop for you guys. Uh, finally, the most amazing book gift of the year came to us from David Dory. It's a 14-page folio manuscript dated January 22nd, 1785, and it is headed Inventory and Appraisement of All the Goods, Chattels, and Effects of Pierre Eugene du Cimetière, deceased. The executors of his estate were Ebenezer Hazard and the sometime mayor of Philadelphia, Matthew Clarkson. I don't know what times he decided to be mayor, but he was the sometime mayor. <laughs> the interesting thing, the fascinating thing about this is this inventory includes the contents of Du Cimetière's American Museum, a sort of cabinet of natural and historical curiosities. At the estate sale that followed on March 10, 1785, the library company bought almost all the printed and manuscript material that had previously been exhibited at the museum. This was the first major acquisition of American historical papers by an American library, and it remains one of the important collections, one of the most important collections we have ever acquired. The rest of the contents of the American Museum were dispersed. The manuscript that we now have may be the most complete inventory of what some have called first American Museum, and it is an essential addition to our Du Cimetière collection. Finally, the Prince and Photographs Department received a wonderful gift from library company shareholder Randy Plummer. His gift included items from the Philadelphia artist and photographer Frederick DeBoer Richards, 1822 to 1903, to include the garotypes, an ivory type, etchings, and a watercolor, all by Richards, as well as two journals of his European travels. The collection also includes photographic portraits of Richards and assorted family members, photographs of the family's home at the Jersey Shore, membership certificates, and Richards' will. I want to say, before I turn the podium over, I want to say a, a couple, couple words. This year has been a transformative year. And it's been transformative because we have a new and dynamic director. Everything that Mike Barsanti promised us he would be when we interviewed him and when he was in competition for this job, he turned out to be and more. He has breathed great life into this very old institution. And I believe that our future is going to be absolutely spectacular. But I want to end. There, there's more here, but I'm not going to go through it. I want to end by sharing with you a letter that that I just received today because it was sent to Mike, and Mike sent it to all the trustees. And basically, it tells us what the library company is all about, and it makes us know know that we are doing the right thing and that this isn't just a collection of books but it is a living breathing institution and here's the letter dear mike i am writing to express my profound thanks for an unparalleled month of amazing research new insights and unexpected long-term collaborations made possible by the library company. There are so many things to be grateful for that I hardly know where to begin. First, the staff, and particularly Jim, Connie, Jasmine, Linda, and Erica, were fantastic at directing me toward library company resources, both physical holdings and databases. 
that, that I otherwise never would have known of. I'm genuinely astonished by the number of directly relevant, rare, undigitized texts that LCP holds, and that will now take my coral research in exciting new directions. Second, the online databases, and particularly Afro-Americana imprints, are extraordinary tools. Without them, I'd never have found many crucial items in the collection. Third, Cassatt House is a tremendous and unique benefit my time at Library Company was immeasurably enriched by being able to walk just steps to the reading room and only a few blocks to the other archives, not to mention grocery. <laughs> and all for a reasonable monthly rent, along with excellent care and maintenance by Fran and Joe. I truly don't know of any other library that offers such a centrally located, affordable place to stay. Fourth and very much related. The other fellows were amazing. I can't tell you how many productive conversations we had as the direct result of sharing space at Cassatt. I know I will stay connected to many staff members and fellow fellows for years to come. That single month is a gift that will continue to give. Thanks again for all that you and the staff do to make LCP an extraordinary, unique, multifaceted, transformational resource for scholars every day of the year. I will most certainly be back, and I look forward to returning. Michelle, it's Michelle Nabakis, Assistant Professor of English, Miami University, Oxford, Ohio. That came today, and what that tells us, that is living, breathing proof. That is the evidence that it is not just our collections, it is our people along with the collections that make this place so unique and so worth supporting. I know I will continue to do so and I'm sure you will as well. Thank you very much. I now turn this over to, who <coughs> turn this over to Charlie, right? sit down and not be standing between you and a cocktail, but um, 2017, um, we had a little bit higher budget than we did the year before, not unusual. Our budget is about $2.7 million. Um, we were lucky to have a little more uh, income than expense, and so we've got a, about a $50,000 <coughs> net excess. Um, 2018, um, we are 2.8 million. Um, it's about $140,000 more than the previous year. Um, things that have created that, of course, are the usual staff salaries, taxes associated with staff, benefits associated with the staff. Uh, we um, are looking at higher interest rates this year, and um, some of you know that we have a nice piece of real estate behind us here that we have a loan against, so we um, have budgeted a little more expense and the interest payments that we pay for that loan. We've got a new accounting system that uh, is very beneficial for those of us who care about numbers that move across the page, um, but does cost a little bit more than we did before. Um, on the in income side of that ledger, uh, the budgeted in, we have budgeted increases in all of the donation categories. So individuals, corporations, foundations, and grants. Um, and we have reduced the draw on the unrestricted portion of the endowment. We have increased the draw on the restricted side, uh, of which, of course, you know, we try to do to specifically uh, support programs and uh, across the board. And so um, we think we're spending the money wisely in that respect. We're spending it at a rate of 5.8% of the endowment value. Um, just sort of to give you an idea of how all that income 
flows into us. 60% of the budget is represented by income from the endowment. 9% uh, is from programs uh, such as the Birch Seminar and the Franklin Seminar and others. Uh, about 31% is um, you know, just begging for money. Um, probably grants and, and foundations and nice people like you. So uh, that's, that's the makeup. Um, the 2017 for many of us was a great year as it relates to our investment portfolios and it was for the library company of Philadelphia as well. Our domestic equities were at an increase of 21 percent. Mm -hmm. um, the fixed, the um, international portfolio of equities was up 31 percent. The total portfolio had a, uh, advanced 15 uh, percent last year. Uh, this year we are um, about flat um, first three months and um, through uh, April. I think we are down by a less than 1%, which is not a bad thing considering we've taken well over $800,000 out of the portfolio for two quarters worth of draws. So um, we're not predicting that 2018 will be that 2017, however. Um, it'll be more, we believe, and so does Cornerstone, our investment advisor, we believe it'll be more of a normalized uh, movement in the equity market. It's been tough because we are looking at a, a, some people are calling this a weird year um, because almost all of the movements in the equity markets have been event driven as opposed to solid economic uh, news. Economic news is good but it's not over, it's just too many other bad things going on in the market that are not supporting positive change. So um, we're kind of looking at maybe a three to four percent rate of return on the U.S. equity side, and maybe six or seven on the domestic side. Um, so the, the last thing that um, I would say to you is that no, we're not going to get a bull market, but we're not going to get a meltdown either. Um, and that um, the company is solid. That's the most important thing that I can tell you. And, uh, other than that, the most, second most important thing is to hand this over to Mike. <laughs> uh, thank you, Charlie, and thank you, Hal, um, for very kind words. Um, I, I just want to thank the board as a whole, really. Um, I've you know, over the course of my career, I've worked with and served on a number of boards. Um, this is one of the most collegial um, and supportive um, and um, invested boards I've, I've ever seen. And I'm, of my many, many fortunes and good fortunes and good luck in being in this position, um, having a great board is one of the most important ones. So I'm very grateful to for the board I have. Um, <coughs> And I also am so excited that um, Joe and Mariah have joined us as new board members. They are um, fantastic people, really great assets to the organization. Um, I've been the director of the library company for over a year now. It's been about 14 months. Um, and I'm still incredibly excited about being here. Uh, I still feel incredibly grateful to be here. Um, it is an enormous privilege to work at the Library Company of Philadelphia, and um, it's even more so a privilege to help guide it into its fourth century, which is just over the horizon. Um, you, the shareholders, are really the miracle of this organization. Um, I think a lot about that moment in the spring of 1731 when uh, Ben Franklin and other members of the Junto decided to form this company. And um, they knew they needed 50 people to put down 40 shillings. Still a mystery to me why they never say two pounds. It's always 40 shillings. And they spent the next six months finding those people. And I, I, I think a lot about you know the Sunday morning. Philadelphia is a city of 13,000 people in 1731. It wasn't a lot of people. And getting 50 people to put down what was basically two weeks wages to form a library that something you'd never 
heard of before and had no idea, is something of a real accomplishment um, in the fundraising field. Ben Franklin has claimed as one of the great fathers of American philanthropy. Um, and you can imagine him and the other members of the Junto as well um, going around gathering up these contributions. I imagine sometimes um, your forebear shareholders um, on some Sunday morning in Philadelphia coming down the stairs and saying to their spouse, honey, I, I, I was out last night at the tavern and I, I told Ben Franklin I'd join his library for 40 shillings. I hope it's okay. <laughs> David, <Even> what? <laughs> for what? Um, but, you know, as, as I said in the op-ed that I co-wrote uh, back in December, you know, the oldest library in Philadelphia, one of the oldest in the, in the country, did not start out as a library. It started out as a learning community. It started out as a group of people, your ancestor shareholders, um, who wanted to get together and learn from each other. And that, what we are finding in the world of libraries is that as technology changes, and as technology makes the model of the library um, shift, that we find ourselves increasingly coming back to that original idea <coughs> of a library being a learning community, a place where people come to learn from the resources, but also, and quite importantly, from each other. Um, and the library company has a, it, that is part of our DNA, that's part of where we began. And um, I look forward in many ways, I think, as we think about our strategies and moving forward, it's, it's sort of a, it's, it's back to the future in that sense, back to the learning community that is the origin of this great institution. Um, Hal very kindly read the, the email that I sent around today, which came from a scholar. Um, let's see, first of all, the, Michelle's email, I, I try to talk to all of the fellows and scholars that come through. And that story that she tells is not uncommon. Um, the only thing that's uncommon is that she you know, had to wrote me an email about it, but when they sit in my office and say, I had an extraordinary experience here, um, you know, Connie, you know, I, I thought I came here looking at for A, B, and C, but Connie showed me X, Y, and Z, or Jim showed me those other things that completely changed my dissertation, completely changed my approach. Um, and I ask, I ask every scholar who comes through, what makes this place, like, how, how do we compare it to other research libraries? And uh, the answer they give is always the same. They say, well, you serve scholars better than anyone else. Um, you serve scholars well through sitting down next to them and helping guide them through their research. You serve them through the sat house. You serve them through fostering this community of scholars. And um, one, of, one of the things I'll, I want to do today is to talk you through some of the things we're learning in our strategic planning. But this idea of our core identity and our core skill being service to scholars is something that keeps coming through. And I want to thank Hal for bringing that email to you because it does really express what the library company um, of 2018 is when it's at its best. And it's at its best all the time. Uh, I hear that from fellows and I hear that from researchers. Uh, the same stories I hear all the time. Um, so really I, I want to, um, this is all different variations on a theme, but um, it is the staff um, who are our primary asset and who are the reason for that distinction and, the, and are the strength behind our core there. And I, before saying anything else, I want to thank all the staff for the excellence that they bring to their work um, and for the service that they do provide. Um, <laughs> that said, I wanted to recognize some of the staff who, um, who some of our staff changes that occurred in 2017. Um, Holly Phelps, who was our chief of cataloging and uh, worked here in, one, in several different cataloging capacities for over 30 years, retired at the end of 2017. One of the things I've found in talking to scholars is that one of the things they love about us at the library company is that our cataloging is excellent. Um, as good or better than the British libraries, I've heard. It's, and this is not something you see. This is not something you necessarily feel when you walk in the building, but for scholars, it's incredibly important. Um, a book that isn't properly cataloged doesn't, may as well not exist. You're not going to find it. It's invisible. And Holly carried on a tradition and really fulfilled a tradition of excellence in cataloging that now the, our new chief of cataloging, Ariel Rambo, is continuing. We will miss her, but she um, did the most important thing she could do, which is to pass on all of her knowledge, or much of it anyway, to Ariel, who is carrying on that tradition. Um, we said goodbye to Nicole Joniak in 2017. Nicole 
um, was really one of the great mainstays of our staff and really helped to take our, um, our digitization projects and access to digital records and also a lot of work in the prints and photographs room. Um, Nicole was one of these people when she left, there was several weeks of panicking of what are we going to do without Nicole? But um, Nicole went to the Bryn Mawr libraries um, and one of the things she was, a, she is a, an incredibly careful person and thoughtful and left behind a wonderful plan for her succession that has really helped us. Um, and uh, Conchetta Barbera has picked up a lot of, and um, Anne McShane have both picked up a lot of Nicole's work and have carried that forward as well. Crystal Apaya um, left us uh, last February, just before I started, to start the role as a special collections instruction librarian at University of Virginia. Um, we've recently hired Jasmine Smith, um, <coughs> not exactly to replace Crystal, but to be on the path towards building some of Crystal's knowledge. We miss Crystal a great deal, um, but uh, we are proud of what she has gone on to do. Um, Kate Philipson, who was in development, has left to pursue her master's in archives and public history at New York University. Um, so we miss all of these people. Uh, it's, I want to mark them here, but we're also very proud of the tradition we have here of training professionals who go out and then become leaders in the field um, once they leave. And all of these folks certainly follow that. Um, let me get into uh, more of the part of the discussion that was billed for me to talk to you about today and talk to you about our um, strategic planning. Um, one of my first, we're not done with the process yet. I'm going to talk to you a little bit about where we are. Um, but we've gone enough through it at this point, we're most of the way through, that we've learned a lot about ourselves. Uh, we've learned a lot about the organization and how we're perceived. One of my first charges when I started here as a director was to initiate a strategic planning process. Um, that would help the library choose a course for its next phase. And looking as far off as our 300th anniversary in um, 2031. And we were working, as Hal mentioned earlier, we're working with an excellent consulting firm based out of Boston called TDC. TDC is a Boston-based firm, but they've done a lot of work for Philadelphia organizations and for Philadelphia history organizations. And are certainly well known within the philanthropic community here. So um, we are very happy to be working with them. They bring to their work um, a, a level of rigor, particularly around financial analysis um, and around the broader research that has been incredibly helpful and informative to us. Um, this is the five-step process that TDC has sketched out for us. Um, not sure how much, I'm just going to move, not sure how much you can see from this. It's a little eye strain inducing. There are five phases. The first is a discovery phase. Um, which involves interviews with stakeholders and board and staff, um, and the development of several kind of hypothetical areas for strategic growth. That was followed by a period that's called internal analysis, where they looked deeply into our financials, into all of our programmatic activity. Um, they gave Harriet a migraine. Um, it, it, they did a lot of work in digging into our financial records and digging into all of the work that we do in order to produce a very detailed assessment of our internal operations. Third step is an external analysis. And any of you who got the online survey that was sent out in March helped us with that process. Um, that um, external analysis consisted of a online survey that was completed by over 250 people. Um, there was a set of 40 interviews with peers, um, with people from peer organizations and other people out in the field, as well as just review of literature by the, by the group. And just this past week, we had a uh, retreat where the staff and board got together to talk about that external research. And I've, I've picked out some of the highlights of that research that I'll share with you in a moment. This is the mission statement as it uh, I believe as it appeared in the last strategic planning process. Um, we are, have not really focused our attention on the mission statement. That often is one of the first things you do in strategic planning. What we're doing here is a somewhat different process. Um, but this, is, this mission statement, I think in many ways, still fits very well with what we do and how we have guided the organization over uh, the last few years. To foster scholarship and increase public <coughs> understanding of American history before 1900, by preserving, interpreting, making available, and augmenting the valuable materials in our care, thus providing meaningful stewardship of the legacy of founder Benjamin Franklin. Um, 
that is our mission. And those are all things that we do, and we follow this mission. Um, as a student of mission statements, I well know that probably every one of these words was a battleground at one time. But still, that really fits well with the way in which we have approached our work. Um, this is a draft of the sort of vision hypothesis, just by way of contrast. This was some statements that emerged early in the process, and so you shouldn't take them to mean the sort of the final galvanized result. Um, and it's not quite as comprehensive as a mission statement, but I think it gestures towards some of the broader aims that this process is going towards. By 2022, the Library Company of Philadelphia will be widely known in academia and in the Philadelphia region as an innovation hub for history and the humanities. This vision builds on our history as a place where people come to improve their lives by sharing ideas and on our strength as a learning community that attracts the highest caliber scholars. By catalyzing scholars' interests and making research accessible, we'll expand the knowledge of how to engage all people in the life of the mind. So this was sort of our opening hypothesis that came at the end of that first phase. This led to, <laughs> I feel a little self-conscious about this drawing, it's, it's rather elaborate, but this led to the creation or the development of what we refer to as five vision pillars. This is all sounding very strategic planning language, but basically what we're talking about are five areas of activity, five areas of program in the broadest sense. Um, these five areas are up here at the very top, and they've been grouped here into three, confusingly enough, columns, but for the moment I want you to just focus on these five areas, which are the most important buckets or categories that describe our current and future activity. The first one, collection. This, these are our activities that relate to the management, acquisition, building, and um, storage, access to our collection um, at the center of what we do. The other two relate to our relationships to scholars and our scholarly audience. First, the first, what we call the scholarly community, I would say this is the category into which we put a lot of our current activity, um, the funding of fellowships. Uh, for instance, is probably one of the, it's, fellowships are the largest program that we have. This is sometimes a surprise for people to learn. Second, after salaries, it's our largest budget item. And if you look at our fellowship program relative to that of our peers as independent research libraries, <coughs> we give out, in the last few years, we've given out around 60 fellowships. Um, relative to our budget size, that is an incredible number. Um, it's much more than even peers who are twice our size give out. It's a really important part of what we do. And as you heard, of, again, harkening back to the email that you just heard read, like that's service to scholars is, at the, is what we do best and is at the core of our work. So if nothing else, that's our core. And that's where we are going to keep a lot of our time and investment. But the second pillar is called the history incubator. Language around this will change. But this is the idea that insofar as our goal is to serve scholars. And also, insofar as the world of scholars is changing, the world of the academic humanities is changing dramatically. The number of jobs available to new PhDs in history is plummeting. Um, the field of history and the humanities is changing. It's incumbent upon us to help scholars adapt to that changing environment. It's also incumbent upon us to find ways to share our collection more broadly. And so the concept of the history incubator is to assist scholars in finding ways for their research in our collections to reach a, directly reach a broader public. Right now, most of the work that happens in this room and in the reading room upstairs, most, this is sort of the engine room of the library company you're sitting in. Most of the work that happens here um, gets produced in academic journals, uh, dissertations, academic presses. It comes out through this academic system. What we want to do, both to serve scholars and help them adapt to this changing environment, but also to become more present to our community is to provide ways for that scholarship to reach directly reach new audiences by helping scholars develop new kinds of approaches, whether those are podcasts or documentaries or plays or uh, graphic novels. This is what the History Incubator is about. And the final two areas, the life of the mind and education. Life of the mind, again, this into this bucket, this is basically adult public programming. So when you think about our Franklin Seminar that Hal mentioned, or the Birch Seminar that's about to begin, um, or the 
book talks or the other lectures that happen here, those are life of the mind programs. What we want to do, we have, we have done this work. This is not new. We have done it. But what we want to do is to really be intentional about thinking about the goals of this programming as a set and to make sure that you, particularly you as shareholders, feel that you have a stake in this learning community and that your share and your membership in the library company is that the value of that for you is also about your membership in this community. Um, so in the Birch Symposium that's coming, in the Birch Seminar rather, not the Symposium, the Birch Seminar, um, we have offered a significantly reduced price for shareholders because that should be a shareholder benefit. Shareholders get preferred registration for these seminars. Um, that life of the mind is about increasing in some ways, the learning community aspect of your library company share. Education, this is the last pillar, and this relates again to activity we already do, and that's about how do we take our collections and bring them to more of a K-12 to educational uh, audience. A lot of what we do now is to, to do teacher training. That's one of the most effective ways we have of doing what we do best and getting that work in front of kids in school. Um, but we wanted to explore in our strategic planning process what are better ways of doing that, what are the ways that fit the library company best to fulfill that really important part of what the library company is here to do. That's a lot. <laughs> I'm sorry. That's a lot to swallow. So at the planning retreat last week, we brought the board and the staff together to take the research that had been done, all of this external data, and to take these five pillars I just sketched out for you and to mash them together. What in the research supports what we want to do as a strategy? What in the research doesn't support it? And how does that help guide us as we think about implementing it? Let me just walk through some of the highlights that were in the research. And this research, again, it comes from a number of places. There's the online survey. There's interviews. Um, there's literature, like field research. Um, this, this particular slide is one I think we all, when I first saw this, I gasped. <laughs> um, let you figure out why I gasped. Um, so this is survey respondents. The, the response rate on the survey was very good, I have to say. We got, it was uh, close to 10% of people responded to the survey, which for online surveys is quite good. This was shocking to me. I would have said our, our membership and our constituents skew older, but that older is much more dramatic in these numbers than I would have thought. And when you factor in the fact that this is an online survey, which may be seen to have, make it, which may not have as much participation by people over the age of 65, you can think that this may be even understating that effect. What does this mean? Um, this means that Rachel and I are talking much more <laughs> about planned giving opportunities. Um, <laughs> this, this also means that obviously we have a lot of work to do. Um, and that uh, we have a lot of work to do. But we also want to think about how do we serve this audience best? How, what are the experiences, what are the kinds of ways in which people who are uh, 65 and over want to <coughs> interact with a library company? Um, uh, just general satisfaction. This isn't terribly surprising. A lot of these survey results are not shocking. Um, they're not terribly surprising. They're more confirming what you might already believe intuitively. Um, satisfaction with our experiences, exhibitions, customer service very high. Again, this speaks to the service that people receive, especially as researchers here. Um, community engagement, um, we have a C plus for community engagement, 69%. Um, I think this relates to our um, not presenting or not really communicating much about the work that we do in education and also the fact that it hasn't really been, it hasn't been a priority of the library company to do this, frankly. I mean, the way that we engage with the community is through our scholars and through our public programs. But again, here is, but I, I think this is something, it is an area that tells us where we need to do work, but it also is a matter of like making us think about what is our strategy, what are our strengths. This was an interesting slide to me. This breaks out our members and shareholders by the length of their service or their length of their membership. Um, what's striking is that for members who have been members for over seven years, a significant majority uh, say that they see their connection to library company history um, as 
a, a reason for their membership. For, but if you look over here at public programs, the balance is really different. People who have been shareholders for less than seven years talk about public programs as a major part of their shareholding. Um, general areas of interest for donation. I was surprised. I'm not surprised to see that a lot of people want to give to collecting. I was surprised it was so high for general operating support. <laughs> <laughs> Um, this is a summary of uh, research around our organizational reputation. These are points you've already heard today. We have a strong reputation among academics. Our constituents are highly loyal. Um, a great constituency is greatly skewed toward the older end of the spectrum. Current donors most interested in the collection. Um, this is an important slide. Um, this was in a section of the research that talked about the history incubator specifically. This shows that interest in the history incubator is especially high among our researchers, also program attendees. Um, interest in financial support, though, is softer. Um, our donors are still unsure about supporting the history incubator initiatives. That makes sense because the donors don't know what they are yet. Um, we're just getting this started, and this is where I think, as a strategy for the history incubator projects, it's going to require an institutional giving. It's going to require investments from foundations who often play this role of providing seed capital to new initiatives. Interest in public programming, what's an interesting takeaway here is that our researchers are, our fellows in particular, overwhelmingly interested in participating in library company programming. One of, the, one of the larger takeaways, I'll talk about this in a moment, is this kind of disconnect between the experiences of shareholders and donors and the experiences of our researchers. These are two different worlds at the library company, and the simplest thing in the world would be for us to do more to get our fellows to be presenting on their research to you. Um, and we do that, but I think it's, it would, if you were to hear more of what our researchers were doing, you would be incredibly excited by it. It's fascinating work. So here are the key takeaways. Supporting scholarship is our core. You've heard me say that a lot, but that is um, you know, key principle of strategic planning. When you find out what you do well, don't screw it up. Keep doing that. <laughs> Scholars and supporters see different sides of the library company. That was what I was just saying. There's this disconnect or this uh, between the donor base and the members and shareholders of the library company and the scholars. Um, and what is tantalizing about that is that connecting those is not a difficult thing to do and will benefit both sides. Um, our supporters. Members, sh members, shareholders are very interested in supporting the care and expansion of the collection. Newer supporters like programming. Long-term supporters like the connection to tradition. <laughs> I still am going back and forth on whether this, how the importance of this particular fact, um, because it's sort of a self-evident thing. If you've been a member for a long time, then <coughs> you're interested in the long-term tradition of the organization. Um, scholars see the value of innovation. Supporters need more information about the innovation program. Um, our goodwill in the scholarly community is a vast and underutilized asset. And you heard it from that email today as a great example of that. Um, I think so often, this is not a new observation. People know this. But where this conversation has often gone is, well, scholars aren't great donors. They're not. <laughs> By and large, they're not a great fundraising base. But they are great bases of content. They provide enormous amounts of content. Um, they want to use us to help distribute their content. They're a great source of value for us. And there's so much we can do to just fully realize that. So the final two steps remaining are planning, which is to take all of this analysis we've done and to actually start to hang numbers on it and to see what the operational implications of these changes would be, expanding our public programming, expanding and keeping our service to scholars at or above its current level, and then providing the documentation. What's important about this plan, I told the planners, we don't want a long to-do list. What we want is a set of priorities and decision-making tools that will help us, that are more flexible over time. And that's the end. Thank you very much. And thank you. significantly over. I would like to welcome you to the opening of the William Russell Burchett Commission. <laughs> <laughs> this is the proceeding. We will not stand in the way of...
uh, going over there, is there any uh, business to be raised now from the floor? Uh, hearing none, do I have a motion for adjournment? So moved. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Done. <laughs>